Okay. Hello there, this is Kendo Nagasaki, Peter Thornley, the man behind the mask, and I am watching Cheap Shot Entertainment this afternoon and, and this morning and tonight. Hope you all join me. Bye! Promotional consideration paid for by the following. <laughs> Awesome. This is awesome. Hello, welcome wrestling fans to another retro wrestling review for Cheap Shot Entertainment. I am so sorry I completely missed out the May pay-per-view of 2004. It's the first time in four years that I've actually missed a pay-per-view. I did watch it, just didn't get around to recording the uh, the review. However, that was Judgment Day, and I can confirm that it was not great. So let's see if Bad Blood is any better. It is a Raw brand exclusive pay-per-view, and it was attended by 9,000 fans in attendance, and it was from Columbus, Ohio, at the Nationwide Arena. Uh, the theme song for this Pay-per-view is Sold Me by Seether and the game appears, or the arena rather, appears in the games WWE 2K15, WWE Day of Reckoning 2, WWE WrestleMania 21 and WWE Smackdown vs Raw. And just before we get going, uh, obviously uh, it is JR and Jerry Lawler on commentary, but the pre-show features Batista, um, of which, you know, a year's time, Batista would be world champion. Um, sorry if that's a bit of a spoiler, but he defeated Maven in Sunday Night Heat. Uh, so, yeah, basically, what is a pre-show? Moving on to the first match, we get the uh, all the promo package and all that kind of stuff. Pretty cool promo package. Um, the feud between Triple H and, and Shawn Michaels is still ongoing after years. Um, and we move on to the first match. It is for the World Tag Team Championships. And the champions of the World Championship tag team division are la resistance once again in a different um combination sylvan ranier and robert robert conway um which he was um announced as and the commentators the jr and uh, and uh, jerry lawler do have a bit of a, a laugh about that incidentally the commentary table is up on the stage for raw pay-per-views much like it is on the raw show which is an interesting way of doing things different and it's just one of the ways that smackdown was different to raw etc um always struck me as kind of weird but also kind of cool as well um good view of everything that's going off but also quite far away from the action um but the tag team champions the world tag team champions would defend their championships against edge and the current world heavyweight champion chris benoit so he had a chance to be a double champion at this point and of course um edge and chris benoit are also from canada so the <laughs> so la resistance singing the canadian national anthem to no fanfare at all because obviously they're in Columbus, Ohio. Made no sense. However, um, the match itself was pretty decent. Um, all four members of this match did get some did get some offense in. Um, it would come down to um, Chris Benoit uh, almost almost um, getting speared by edge uh to which sylvan ronnier um would 
no, I think it was Robert Conway actually, um, would go in for the kill, go for the um, blindsided attack. Uh, Edge would move out of the way and Chris Benoit would get him in the crippler crossface. And uh, he was right near the ropes, but he just couldn't quite get there. And just as he was about to tap, the fire burns. Kane comes down to ringside and spoils the party. Uh, attacks Chris Benoit. He's got a championship match with him later on in the night. So Chris Benoit pulling double duty here at Bad Blood. Um, I didn't think the roster was that thin, to be honest, but clearly so. Um, attacks Chris Benoit, subsequently attacks Edge as well. And the referee has no choice but to call this one a disqualification. Uh, Chris Benoit and Edge do pick up the victory here, but obviously under championship rules, this means that La Resistance keep the championships. A cheap way to hold on to the titles, I'm sure you'll agree. And something that my tag teams would never, ever do. Check out the Aspire Wrestling Alliance. Anyway, we move on to the next match. And for that match, just before we move on, um, I'm going to give that one a three cheap shots out of five. And just before getting into our next match, we are joined in the back with Randy Orton, who is cutting a promo reminding people that he left Mick Foley, the hardcore legend, in a pool of his own blood. He is now a legend in his own right. And that Shelton Benjamin is not even on his level. Something that I actually can't disagree with. Randy Orton at this time was awesome. And, uh, you know, he believed his hype. And there was hype. And it was good. Um, one of the class of 2002. Uh, along with John Cena and uh, Brock Lesnar, of course. And Shelton Benjamin to some extent. Um, so, yeah, that match coming up later on. In the meantime, we've got the second match, which is Chris Jericho back in his WrestleMania 20 gear against Tyson Tomko, the bodyguard of Christian, who recently betrayed his best friend and joined forces with Trish Stratus, who Chris Jericho was having a on off on screen affair with during that feud um and she turned at wrestlemania chris stratus does join tomko at ringside and it would be that which would cost tomko the win here because chris jericho would send tomko into the uh Waiting Trish Stratus, who was on the apron trying to distract Chris Jericho, and uh, he hits an Enziguri after a hard fought match. And Tomko goes down and he goes down for the three. I thought this match was that finish in particular was a bit weird with the Enziguri. Great move, obviously. <coughs> Step up off the knee and kick your opponent around the back of the head, by all means. Uh, it should um, give that uh, that victory. But, I mean, to me, it's kind of like if you can super kick someone and still get up, obviously times have changed, then uh, an insecurity probably shouldn't have finished the match, but it did. So there you have it, a uh, victory for Chris Jericho, a, uh, an escape, if you will, from Tyson Tomko's gripped and the attempt of Christian to uh, take out his former best friend. And um, yeah, I'm going to give this one a two cheap shots out of five. We're now moving on to the Intercontinental Championship match featuring Randy Orton defending his championship against... Shelton Benjamin uh, and uh, of course 
Randy Orton would be joined out at ringside by Ric Flair. And uh, Ric Flair would try and get involved. He would get sent to the back quite early on after a dive from uh, Shelton Benjamin after a, an attempted trip. And there was a lot of uh, interference from Ric Flair in this one. Um, once Ric Flair had gone, the match really did pick up. There was a lot of high flying, a lot of really good moves, well executed moves, very athletic. Both of these guys. Back in 2004, they're both young'uns as well. They're around just over 20 years of age. And of course, uh, Randy Orton would be 24 on this particular year. And I think Shelton was around about the same age. So, um, yeah, it, it was um, a really good match uh, and fitting of the hype. And it should have had a bit more hype, but... Randy Orton was more focused on being a legend killer at this point in time and cutting promos on Mick Foley than on Shelton Benjamin. But it would be uh, Randy Orton retaining the championship title and it would be a dodgy finish, a roll-up with a handful of tights uh, from the point of view of Randy Orton who retains his championship. I'm going to give this one three and a half cheap shots out of five. Very enjoyable Intercontinental Championship match for this one. We now move on to the Women's Championship match. It's just before they changed it to the Divas title, so it's still the Women's Championship, although they weren't given the rub of the green. You can tell that these ladies have worked really hard you can tell that they've, they've been training with uh, a legend in in fit finley but it is a fatal four-way match to um, decide who would walk away with the championship victoria defending her championship against trish stratus lita and gail kim uh, lita does re-injure herself at, uh, at quite early on in this match she does have a tendency to get a bit injured in matches at the moment uh, a couple of points where nothing was happening because they'd either missed a cue or forgotten something uh, i know <laughs> having planned a match just yesterday in wrestling training that this is really one of those things that is quite common and uh, i'm not going to dock any points for that obviously with them being in wwe it does make a big difference in terms of the crowd uh, they were pretty into it though and uh, with the likes of lita tristratus uh, gail kim and uh, victoria you've got four women who were are and are really good at this point in time so it's a shame that they weren't given a lot of time to play with this because a fatal four ways, obviously no holds barred and it could have been really, really good. That being said, it's OK. So I am going to give this one two cheap shots out of five and hopefully the women's division will start picking up soon so I can give them some better review scores. We move on now to a match between Eugene and Jonathan Coachman. Eugene, of course, is the nephew of Eric Bischoff in kayfabe. Eric Bischoff doesn't want to have him on his show and he's employed Jonathan Coachman to make his life a living hell. In the meantime, William Regal has joined with uh, Eugene. Uh, unceremoniously did not want to do it he was put in that position to look after him make sure he didn't get himself into trouble but over time and this is one of those storylines that was a sort of secondary tertiary storyline but was really played out very well by some very very good performers including William Regal who is an absolute legend um, so the story is that William Regal didn't want to do it to start with, but then formed a bond with Eugene and uh, started to uh, sort of train him and give him tips and look after him uh, a bit more than he uh, than Eric Bischoff was perhaps 
expecting him to do. Um, so this match, coach, you can tell he's he's athletic, uh, and he does his very best to, and he does take the moves really well. He does give out the moves really well. So for uh, an on-screen talent that's not an in-ring talent, he's he's pretty decent, to be fair, is the coach. And, uh, yeah, he, he gets it. Uh, Eugene is one of those characters that's a sign of the times, and he definitely won't be able to get away with it now. But what Eugene was is basically every character that you've ever created in a wrestling game whereby you can do everybody else's moves at will and uh, just you know he's just a massive fan and he takes the stone cold stunner the rock bottom the pedigree and uh, and all these other favorite moves from his favorite wrestlers and and does them without a care in the world and it's really cool um played by nick dinsmore who was previously doing the clown as well nick is an established wrestler he was really really quite good uh, and to be given this character and for it to still be going now it says a lot about how well he has done um you know i've seen eugene books on a uk independent wrestling show fairly recently and um i don't know whether he's wrestling or not or whether he was just sort of there but um yeah he's, he's still knocking about which is pretty cool um, there is some interference here, but Eugene sorts that out. William Regal comes down after a bit more cheating and takes care of business. And Eugene wins with a Stone Cold Stunner. I quite enjoyed this match, I'll be honest. But it is just a three cheap shots out of five for this one. We move on now to the semi-main event the world championship match between chris benoit and kane to retain the tie uh, to uh, defend the championship belt he must go through the fires of hell in kane and of course kane attacking chris benoit earlier on in the night when he was going for his wwe uh, sorry his world tag team championships with with the uh, edge um and um yeah kane came down attacked chris benoit um obviously la resistance got disqualified and they kept the championships but meanwhile uh kane injured chris benoit and that was a good way to get things started um so Chris Benoit really fights hard here. He, he does all his diving moves, his headbutts and um, suplexes and things. Kane is a monster that can also fly and does his best to capture that championship. And you can tell why these two are in the semi-main event. Because they are very, very good and they have great chemistry. But it would be Chris Benoit who would get the victory and retain his championship in this one. I'm going to give this one three and a half cheap shots out of five simply because it had to play precursor to one of the best matches I have seen for a very long time. And that is Hell in a Cell. The final conflict, although they've had several final conflicts over the time that uh, they've been feuding since 2002, really has come about now. It's uh, Hell in a Cell, Triple H versus Shawn Michaels. And it is one hellacious match. Both end up bleeding. Both fly into the cage. They both use weapons. They just tear into each other beat each other from pillar to post and ultimately Shawn michaels just couldn't overcome his adversary as triple h hits the pedigree for the several uh, after several occasions of, of trying and hitting it a couple of times as well 
Shawn Michaels didn't have enough to kick out of the final one. Great match, really good to watch. Um, a masterclass in how to do a cage match, a grudge match. There's no holds, there's no lockups. It was just straight in, pound each other until one of you got the upper hand. And uh, I'm going to give that one four cheap shots out of five. Like I said, really good match. Overall, um, these split brand pay-per-views, I remember them being much better <laughs> than they actually are, having watched these now. Um, the 2003 ones were decent, but we're going into, like, we're already into 2004. And the last two split brand pay-per-views have been a bit hmm obviously the main events have always been good and um a couple of the matches in between but neither brand has anything for the women um smackdown doesn't even have a women's championship so they've really got nothing to fight for and because uh, it's not one that hot potatoes between brands which I always found strange, especially because they didn't bring in a women's championship for SmackDown like they have now. But overall, I would say Raw just peaks SmackDown on the pay-per-views. This one was more consistent in its approach to a pay-per-view and therefore was very entertaining as far as it goes. A couple of Sad matches in the women's fatal four way just didn't give didn't get given enough time. Um the tag team championships uh got way you know, sidelined uh for the purpose of pursuing the Chris Benoit Kane angle. The the Intercontinental Championship match, really, really good. The Hell and Cell match, really, really good. And I did quite enjoy Eugene and Jonathan Coachman, and I'm not afraid to say that. So, we move on to the next pay-per-view, which happens to be the Great American Bash. And we don't have to wait very long for the Great American Bash, because it did take place on June the 27th in Norfolk, Virginia. And it, that was a SmackDown-only pay-per-view. And if you are a big wrestling nerd like I am, you'll remember how infamous this pay-per-view was. So, um, join me on that one on the 27th of June, and I will see you then, wrestling fans. Goodbye.